Hi, I'm Sharon DiPolito. I'm going to be starting with Chapter 21, The Magician's Magnificent Mansion. On Saturday morning, I walk Mr. Pugsley. He snarls whenever I talk about Ainsley. That afternoon, Hannah invites me to go shopping with her at the mall. The regular one, she says, not that ridiculously expensive winter set collection. I can, I tell her. Why? Is there a Nellie Dumont Frise marathon on PBS? No, I'm uh, working on a project at this other kid's house. What kind of project? It's all about gravity, I say, because I figure a levitation trick would definitely have something to do with gravity. Dad drives me over to Tim's house, which is as big as a castle. It's exactly the same kind of a house we used to drive around and look at on weekends. It's three stories of towering stone, peaked roofs, and a ginormous windows. You could fit our whole house inside Tim's living room. Wow, says Dad. Yeah. Have fun. Tim's parents are out of town, but their live-in housekeeper, a live-in housekeeper, fixes us some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with the crust trimmed off. You want to see my magician's lair? Tim asks when we're done with lunch. You have a lair? It's more like a warehouse in the garage. That's where the new levitation trick is. We go through a door off the mudroom and enter his five-car garage, where there are only two cars, but tons of props for magic tricks stored in bins and on tall shelves that fill up most of the space. This is amazing, I say. My parents bought me all this stuff, Tim tells me. I've only used half of it, so far anyway. It's like a magic museum, I say, admiring an antique lacquered box with swords sticking out of its sides. Mom's just happy I have a hobby, Tim tells me. Have your parents ever seen you perform? Mom has. Dad's always too busy, flying here, flying there, making deals. Tim shows me a few of his favorite linking loop and card tricks. He waves his hands and he says, piff, piff, a lot. He asks me if I want to stand in the lacquered box while he jabs his swords at it. No thanks, I say. Maybe next time. Okay, here's the levitation stuff. He points to two chairs, propping up a board covered in red fabric. He lifts up a small mannequin and lays it face up on the board. I uh, get a volunteer to lie down on the board like so. Okay, this is the important part. Their center of gravity has to be directly over one of the chairs, this one. So there's science and magic? Definitely, there's also magic and science, especially physics. Piff, piff. Okay, when my volunteer center of gravity, their belly button, is over the seat of this chair, I put a blanket on top of them. I pull away this other chair and ta-da, they levitate. Wow, I say, because the dummy seems to be floating in space. Wait, says Tim excitedly, it gets better. Next, I pull away this board, the one you're lying on, and he stops. What's wrong, I say? Did you see the second board? What? The one wrapped in fabric so it looks like a flat red sheet on top of the board I pulled away? No. You had to see it. I, I didn't. Tim starts shaking. I ruined it. That's the secret. I swear. The hidden board is clamped to the chair, he says, his voice trembling. I ruined it. The trick's ruined. I try to convince Tim that I didn't see the second board. He just keeps shaking his head and muttering the word ruined over and over. I don't know what to do, and so I try to get him thinking about something else. Hey, is that a swimming pool, I ask, pointing at the window. Yeah, Tim mumbles. Can I see it? Fine. Tim leads me out into the backyard, which kind of looks like a golf course where somebody trimmed every blade of grass with scissors. The swimming pool is covered with a tarp. We don't use it in the winter, says Tim. Well, maybe you could turn it into a hockey rink. Maybe. I'll ask Dad the next time he's home. Poor Tim. He seems kind of lonely in this big house. Hey, I say, you want to have dinner with me and my dad? It, it's Saturday night, so it'll be hot dogs and baked beans. Thanks, but I'm not hungry. Well, dinner's not till later. I won't be hungry then either. I wonder if I did or said something wrong. His driver, Tim has one of those too, takes me home. Dad and I have our standard Saturday night dinner, and guess what? Those hot dogs and baked beans taste even better than usual. Chapter 22, Flipping the Calendar and Flipping Out. January rushes by. Except for homeroom, I'm doing a pretty good job blending in at Chumley and avoiding Ainsley. I walk Mr. Pugsley every afternoon and twice a day on the weekends. I tell him some jokes, some jokes Kwame tells me. 
You know why dogs run around in circles? Because it's too hard to run in squares. <laughs> Mr. Pugsley snorts backwards. Ha ha ha. That's how you know when you don't have much of a snout. I forgot about working I forgot about working on my who do you want to be project. My last entry was not Mrs. Zamick either. I don't see Hannah too much. She's busy, I'm busy. On a snowy day, Siraj, Emily, Kwame, Tim, and I go on a sledding at the country club. Their families all belong. I've never been to a country club before. They'll put whipped cream and marshmallows in your hot cocoa, if that's what you ask for, which I do. And the hills on the golf course are awesome for sledding. At school, a lot of kids, the ones actively competing for the Excelsior Award, are flipping out, trying to excel at everything at once. Sports and clubs, activities, academics, they're like cosmic dust. They're all over the place. The middle school science fair is February 14th, Siraj reminds us one day at lunch. Even though I don't really need reminding, I've been thinking about what I might do for the fair ever since that first day when Miss Oliverio announced it. That's less than two weeks away. My heart is beating so fast. Chill, suggests Kwame. How can I? The science fair will do more to determine who wins the Excelsior Award than anything else this term. Emily arches an eyebrow. Explain your math. There's only one grand prize winner at the science fair. There are three class presidents, one for every grade. There are several players on the basketball team. And many students maintain straight A averages, etc., etc. Siraj, Siraj draws a quick greater than symbol in the air with his finger. Therefore, the science fair is greater than all other Excelsior endeavors. He makes a good point. We all nod and go back to eating our food. The dining hall at Chumley Prep is nothing like the cafeteria at my old middle school. It's an enormous open room with arches holding up the high ceiling. Lunch is done family style with servers bringing big trays loaded down with bowls and plates to the tables. It's awesome, especially the pasta. We're talking spaghetti and meatballs, baked ziti, or gluten-free vegan lasagna. I like lasagna, says Tim. It's three different kinds of Italian dinners squished together in a layer cake with cheese frosting. But that's vegan cheese, Timbo, says Kwame. The cheese isn't cheese. It's made out of yeast. Yeesh. When all our plates are clean, Emily says, Siraj's logic is solid about the science fair. Winning that would definitely give one an edge in the Excelsior contest. Really, I say? Totally, says Emily. Think about it. The talent show isn't until spring. That takes away Brooke Breckenridge and Ainsley Braden Hammerschmidt's prime opportunities to shine. Mine too, grouses Kwame. Your stand-up routine was hysterical last year, says Siraj. Thanks. How about you, Tim? I ask. Were you in the talent show last year? No, he mumbles, pushing his pasta around with his fork. But I have a new trick. Piff, piff. He holds a water bottle upside down and dramatically removes the cap. Water should gush out. It doesn't. Cool, said Kwame. How'd you do that, man? Tim grins. Very well, don't you think? And then he tells us that magicians never reveal their secrets, which is probably why he was so upset when he thought he'd accidentally reveal the levitation trick was done, even though I didn't see it. At least we don't have to worry about Carter Kelso winning the Excelsior, said Emily. He might be an all-star quarterback, but it's not doing him much good this winter. Which, once again, proves my point about the science fair, says Siraj. This is our only big shot, guys. It's like they designed the Excelsior for a hibble flit. Hey, I said, maybe we should all do one super fantastic project. We'd be awesome together like shooting stars streaking across the night sky. Um, Piper, those typically crash and burn, says Kwame. Okay, bad example. I don't, I don't want to do the science fair, says Tim. But you use physics in your magic tricks, I tell him. True, but I hate doing all that data gathering and hypothesizing. Siraj has a very serious look on his face. As much as I would like to do a Vulcan mind melt with all, with you all, it's probably not our wisest move. Not this year. The Excelsior judges wouldn't be able to determine who did what. Mm, I guess you're right, I say. Game on, says Emily, in a, com in, a comp in, a, in a competitive but not a cutthroat or bloodthirsty way, of course. We all shake hands and wish each other luck.
Suddenly, there's an incredibly loud metallic crash. We whip around in our seats. What we see isn't pretty. Chapter 23, on top of spaghetti. Apparently, a server just tripped and dumped her entire tray. The server slipped on the slick mess. She landed on her butt in an orange sea of goop. Sloppy strands of stringy noodles are everywhere, and I can see a few rolling meatballs. The server has stray spaghetti in her hair. Most of the room applauds, applauds the tray drop because I believe that's officially required response in every school cafeteria and dining hall across America. The poor server stands up. Her white apron is smudged with tomato sauce sludge, and at her feet is a mushy, soggy, squidgy puddle of pasta. The bell rings. People start standing up. It's time to head back to class. I count six cloth napkins at our table. The server needs every single one of them. I pluck them up. What are you doing? Says Siraj. She needs help. You'll be late to class. The Excelsior judges could be watching. I know, but come on, you guys. Tim hesitates for a second, but then he shuffles out of the dining hall, too. I dash over to where the server is wiping off her apron with her hands. Here, I say, giving her the stack of napkins. Thanks. She starts dabbing herself, cleaning her clothes, her face, and hands. I'll grab a mop, I say. I see one resting in a rolling bucket. It's near a table where Ainsley and her royal court are leisurely finishing up their salads. They must never worry about being late for class. That's Piper Millie, I hear Ainsley say. She's quite good at cleaning up messes. She'll even scoop your dog's poop. The girls giggle. I ignore them. I push the mop bucket back to the pasta disaster zone. We'll take it from here, says the server, who's with one of the school's janitors. Behind me, I hear Ainsley and her friends snickering. I look over my shoulder. They're pointing at me. Because I have a strand of spaghetti spot stuck to the heel of my shoe, I step on it with my other shoe to pull it off. You know, the way I do the same thing happens in a bathroom with an overage of roll of toilet paper. And now I'm kind of hopping and skipping across the dining hall floor. Ainsley and her gang applaud me. In fact, they give me a standing ovation. And I didn't even drop anything.